Thank you very much for having us. Um, it's my great pleasure to present Jerome, who's going to tell you today about constructing highly regular expanded graphs from hyperbolic cocktail groups. Take it away. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in this seminar. So this one will be a little bit unusual in the sense that there's also about 20 people in the room here. So I'll try to stay within the focus of the camera, but I might forget, uh, we'll see. So as said, is joint work with my colleague, uh, Marston Condor and with Alex Slobotsky, who I think most people will know, and Francois Tilmani, who is a talented uh, postdoc in Belgium. And so the goal of the talk is to explain how you can obtain a particular family of graphs called expander graphs by using the theory of hyperbolic Coxter groups. And so the talk will use ingredients from a couple of different areas of mathematics. I will not assume that you know these and some of it you can, you can take for granted, but I hope that the overall story will be clear. Um, sorry, my screen is frozen. Okay, so a finite graph is a called an epsilon expander if this parameter h of x is at least epsilon. So what is h of x? You look at a, a graph and uh, say this x and you take any subset v and then you look at the ratio of how many edges connect something inside of V with something outside of V divided by the size of V essentially. So the bigger this parameter is, in some sense, the graph has better connectivity properties. And so, um, of course, this is a little bit meaningless for one particular graph, because if a graph, finite graph is connected, if you make epsilon sufficiently small, you can always achieve this. So the goal of the talk will not be to talk about one particular graph. We will want to fix epsilon once and for all. And then we will want to obtain infinitely many graphs for which this parameter is at least epsilon, for fixed epsilon. So that's very important. It's not about one graph. It's about the family of graphs. Um, we will want these graphs to be um, highly regular. So I've written down the definition of regular. So I think we all know what the usual regular graph is. Every vertex has the same number of neighbors. So now we want uh, higher regularity properties. What does that mean? Well, in addition to every vertex having the same number of neighbors, I can consider an edge and I can look how many triangles contain that edge. If I require this also to be a constant, then I have a zero, a one regularity. I can go on, I can consider a triangle and I could ask in how many uh, pyramids or four clicks is it contained, et cetera, et cetera. And so if I can do that from A0 up to A n minus one, and the last one is not zero, because of course you could just cheat and put zeros, then we will say it's highly regular of level n. So that will be um, regularity. So there will be three important components to the talk, regularity, connectivity, and expansion. So I will uh, try to emphasize how we can get all three of them. So connectivity, what is important is um, if you look at the links in a graph, so what is the link? Consider the vertex uh, V in my picture here. Um, this V has neighbors. Um, and what do I do? Like I look at the edge E1 and E1 is an edge that contains V. So for that in the link, I would have a corresponding vertex, which I by abuse of notation still call E1. And now in the link, I will connect two vertices if the two edges that I started with are contained in a triangle. So E1 and E2 are contained in a triangle. So therefore, I will say E1 and E2 are connected by an edge. E3, on the other hand, is not connected in a triangle with either E1 and E2. So that becomes an isolated vertex. So in this example, this link is no longer connected because it consists of the edge E1, E2 and the vertex E3. So later on, I will tell you that we are not always able to achieve um, higher connectivity. And the reason will always be this kind of prismatic uh, situations that will occur well, the, where it breaks when you look at the link of such a thing. But if it does remain connected, then we will say that it's, if it's already highly regular and it remains connected, we will call it highly regular connected, HRC. So where does this come from? Um, well, we got interested in it by a question by Chapman, Lineal, and Pellet, which was asked in 2019. And this question originates in theoretical computer science in so-called PCP theory, which is 
probabilistic checkable proofs. Um, and this is as much as I know about it, but that's where the question comes from. And they studied highly regular expanded graphs of level two. So level two means it's regular and also the number of triangles on every edge is a constant. And so they asked, can you con construct HR graphs of level three or higher? But three is of course the first open one after two. And we can answer this question positively. And as often happens, well, this question is in the public domain. So other people also solve this question, Fridgut and Elus. I will briefly mention uh, how they solved it by completely different methods. Um, the regularity and the connectivity, so it, uh, they depend on the particular Coxter diagram. So I will define what a Coxter diagram is in a moment. And this Coxter diagram is going to um, correspond to certain polytopes. And for different diagrams, you get different polytopes. And so this regularity and connectivity, you have to read off from the diagram. And it's not always so easy, but you can look case by case and check it. Um, the hardest property is the expansion. That's quite difficult to achieve. And for that, um, we used very deep results from number theory, which we use as a black box, but which are very handy for us. And that comes from a super approximation. And one sort of difficulty in the proof um, is that in order to apply this super approximation, you need Cayley graphs. And I will tell you later what these are. So we will need to switch between the polytopes and the Cayley graphs. Polytopes and symmetry groups. So some of my slides will be a little bit technical and overloaded because I want to write precise statements down, but what I say will often be uh, not so complicated. So the first thing we can look at is you can look at a polytope and you look at a polytope such that K faces are simplices. So simplices are the higher dimensional analoga of uh, triangles or pyramids. So if, if you have a K face, which is a simplex, and you also assume that the automorphism group acts transitively on the I faces up to N, now, if you now consider the minimum of K and N, well, then you have at least one K phase, which is a simplex and you have transitivity. So though, then all of them must be simplices. And simplices are good for having this uh, constant number. I mean, because sort of by definition, that's what they have. So if you could get polytopes like this, you, you could get a reasonably uh, good connected regular graph. So connectivity you also get for free. So that's sort of a, a first example where you would be able to achieve a higher regularity. So what is a Coxter system? So a Coxter system is a, a group together with a distinguished generating set S where the generators are subject to certain relations. Namely, um, they are involutions. So all of them square to one. And then you also need to have that if you raise ST to a certain power, um, then gives you one where this MST is an integer. So it could be infinite. That means there is no relationship between S and T, but it could be three or four. And related notions include the Coxter matrix, where you basically store these MS, MIJs uh, in a matrix. Uh, Coxter diagrams, which is a graphical depiction, and Coxter group, where Coxter group just means you think about the group and not so much about the system. So why, why do we suddenly talk about these Coxter systems? We were talking about um, polytopes just before. Well, there's an old result by Jacques Titz that says that if you have a, a string Coxter system, that's a, that's a particular one, I'll, I'll tell you later what that is. But if you have such a system, then you can associate a universal polytope to it. So there is a polytope that corresponds with it. And a polytope uh, being universal means if I tell you what the faces look like, and I tell you um, what the vertex figure looks like, what is incident with the vertex, then there is one polytope which covers all the others that have the same property, and that's called the universal one. For instance, if I tell you the faces are squares and the vertex figure is a triangle, then the cube would be the universal polytope. So there is some abstract polytope that does this. And the group acts nicely on this polytope. So that's the transition between the group theory and the, the polytopes. So one thing which we will need, um, because we want to get to the number theory, the number theory is gonna give us the expansion. And so we want to connect this to bilinear forms. So we have a set of vectors e, EI, and we define a bilinear product between vectors ES and ET by send, setting it equal to minus the cosine of pi over MST. So this MST or these numbers 
and you need to think of them as I said, three, four, and then you get angles like 45, 60 degrees between the vectors and you associate a bilinear product. And you, you might remember, or you might be teaching a basic linear algebra class where you teach your students how you reflect um, a vector with respect to an axis. And then you say, well, you take your vector and you subtract uh, two times. The, so that's this, that's basically this formula. Um, and it's a deep result by Titz that says that this representation is uh, faithful. So that means the, the map into the general linear group is injective. And you end up in the orthogonal group. So you can think of orthogonal matrices if you don't know some of these other terms. And the signature of WS, which is going to be important later, that's the signature of B. For instance, all pluses, positive, definite, all negatives, or a mixture. So that will be important for us as well, this geometric representation. Now, I told you about um, if we take a string Coxter diagram, so that's a special class, then there is a universal uh, polytope by the result of uh, TITS. And we will be able to find one good example or like a couple, well, no, infinitely many, but one up to regularity level four, we will find from this string Coxter diagrams, but we want to go, we wanted to check if we can go further. And therefore we need to enlarge our class of polytopes that we consider to so-called Withoffian polytopes, which are a class of uh, uniform polytopes. They are defined inductively um, as on the screen. So the automorphism group acts transitively on the virtues and the faces are inductively uniform. I mean, this is very hard to imagine what this is. Basically, many of them can be constructed by taking a regular polytope and then deforming it a little bit. Like you can, for instance, take a cube, a truncate of uh, the corners, or you can, instead of taking the virtues of the cube, you take um, the midpoints of the faces and you connect them, you get an octahedron. But you could also take the midpoints of the edges, so you could rectify, rectification is that called. Um, this uniform class of polytopes is very big. Not all of uniform polytopes are with Hoffian, but most known ones are. And there was a counterexample in 1965 by uh, John Conway and Richard uh, Guy. And so you should think of these as being obtained by a so-called kaleidoscopic construction, uh, mirror, if you want to sound less fancy. And as I said, like in the cube, if you take the virtues, you have a cube. If you take the midpoints of the faces, you get an octahedron. If you take the midpoints of the edges, you get a so-called cube octahedron. So this corresponds with a choice of what your vertices are. This will be a distinguished subset M in my next slide. But so you should think of this as what are my vertices. Here is the main result. Um, so the main result basically says about well, that we can answer the question of linear and pilot in the positive. So you take such a Coxter system. M is a subset of S. So this M um, that was in my previous example of the cube, the octahedron, et cetera, that was whether you chose these virtuous edges or faces. That's the M. That's a special subset. And it turns out, just like you had a universal polytope, as Tit said, for this special class of Coxter diagrams, there is also a so-called Withoffian polytope, which you can canonically construct from this Coxter system. OK, the details are, I know, is hard, much to take in. But the point is, you, you start with a group, and you can get a polytope out of it. Um, we suppose that this WS is indefinite, um, that this polytope has finite vertex links. So we, are, we want to have A0, A1, et cetera, regularity. We want our A0 to be a finite number. Like, uh, makes sense, because we want a family of finite graphs. And we want the one skeleton X of this polytope to be to have our regularity properties. So this is difficult. As I said, um, for the thing where we had simplices, we got this for free. But in general, you will have to investigate case by case whether you get these regularity numbers. It's not so easy to have a general theory to construct it. And so what we can prove is that then there exists an infinite collection of finite quotients of the one skeleton. So the one skeleton of a polytope is just Take a polytope and only remember the vertex and edge information. Then you basically get a graph. You forget about all the higher dimensional uh, structure. And so you take an infinite collection of finite quotients of X by normal subgroups of W, and they will form a family of expanded graphs. Illustrating uh, the main theorem. 
So in that way, we can get, so this is an example of a string Coxter diagram. This is where um, the Coxter diagram has no um, uh, bifurcations. It's just a, a straight, it's just a straight line. Um, and we can get uh, 120, 12, 5, 2. So that's up to level four. Um, and this comes from a hyperbolic tessellation in four space. I will come back to that, how we can get this. Um, you, we can get even here connected regular from a Withoffing polytope related to E8. So this comes from the 341 honeycomb. You can look it up if you want. And what is important here is if we don't insist on uh, connectivity, we can get one extra parameter here, five. But otherwise, it breaks down. And we have many other families. So it turns out that if you investigate the Coxter diagrams exhaustively and you check, you can get these sorts of uh, results. Well, how would you prove such a thing? Um, you, we want to make a connection between the Cayley graph and the polytope. Why? Because I said the polytope is going to guarantee connectivity and regularity, but we also want expansion. For expansion, we need number theory, and the number theory will come from the Cayley graph. Now, here's like a here's a problem that we need to resolve. Suppose that you have constructed. Um, these scaly graphs, and you prove that the infinite that these scaly graphs uh, are an expanding family. Well, that doesn't help you very much if you then cannot prove that your corresponding polytopes uh, will not give you a family, such a family. So we need to be able to go back and forth. And the vehicle to do that will be a so-called quasi-isometry. I will define it on the next slide, but it's something which is almost an isometry. So it's almost distance preserving. Uh, and so the result is that if you have this Coxter system and you have your uh, Witoffian polytope, then this one skeleton and the Cayley graph are quasi isometric if you have these finite vertex links. The finite vertex links are only the case we're interested in anyway. So this tells you that these two objects are roughly the same. That's what quasi isometric you should think roughly the same. Um, and so it, it says here it's a non expansive quasi isometry. I will illustrate it. So as I said, quasi isometry means. Uh, between two metric spaces x and y means that you have constants a at least one b and c at least zero such that you deform the distance you might you're allowed to deform it by not by much you have to stay within these uh, boundaries and you you're almost surjective so you're maybe not subjective but there's always something in the image which is not too far away from you so that's a quasi isometry and that's the notion that gromov introduced to study geometry at large scale and here is, here is an illustration of this uh, non-expansive quasi-isometry. So this is, um, these are vertices in the polytope, uh, these two um, red, red ones. And the distance between them is one, if you define it, it's just one. And the distance in the, <clears throat> the graph would go like this, it would be longer. So this one is only one, and this one is longer. But the point is that you don't deform it by more than this. You can compute it in terms of the Coxter group. So then um, what we're going to do is we're going to compare quotients. Because remember, our theorem says that we're going to get an infinite family of quotients that's going to give us expansion. So we now need to investigate what happens to quotients. So we assume that we have a polytope. It has a finite vertex links. And we take a normal subgroup N, and, uh, and then you can look at the quotient map from W to W quotiented by this normal subgroup. And it's not hard to see that if you take the Cayley graph with respect to the Coxer system WS, and you quotient out by N, that's the same as looking at the Cayley graph under projection. So that works well uh, with projection. And here is the point of um, these quasi-isometries. So for every n, um, we get such a diagram. And the point is that if you have this f, then this f of n will be a quasi-isometry with this. You can use the same constants as the one for f. So it does not depend on the n that you have chosen. So we had for a quasi-isometry, we had these constants a, b, and c. And you might think that a priori for different n, I will get different a, b, and c. But that's not true. You can always get the same ones. So you get this commutative uh, diagram. So that works well um, with respect to quotients. OK, now here's a problem. 
if we have started from our X, so I should say what the general philosophy is. The general philosophy is we want to get infinitely many finite graphs that form an expanding family. And our strategy will be to have one infinite graph, a sort of a model object, quotient this out by finite index normal subgroups, and then prove that that family is an expanding family. But now here's already like a problem. What if I destroy the regularity of X? So I assume that my infinite graph had finite vertex things, say everybody has 17 neighbors. But if after quotienting, some of them get a different number of neighbors, then I'm in trouble. So I need to be able to ensure that the regularity is retained when I take the quotient. And it turns out it's su sufficient that you're injective on the neighborhood of any vertex. So if you're never gonna make two vertices uh, collide, you're not gonna uh, fiddle with the regularity. If you don't create any new triangles, then you're not gonna get in trouble with higher dimensional simplices either, because if you get in trouble with higher dimensional simplices, you will already be in trouble with your triangles. So that's all you need to check. And so it turns out that all you want is that the minimal displacement of the action of n on x, so n acts on the vertices, you just want them to always send it away by distance at least four. If you send it away by, by with distance at least uh, with distance three, then these two could collapse and you get a triangle. But if you say it always goes at least four, you will not get any triangles. So this action of n on x having minimal displacement at least four, that will guarantee that you will keep your regularity. How do you translate that? Well, we said that there was a, a correspondence between the distance uh, in the one skeleton and the distance in the Cayley graph by this quasi-isometry. This D here, it was clear when I had my A, B, and C. If I take D sufficiently large, I can take a D which just covers A, B, and C. They take it uh, the maximum or something, then it works. So displacing by at least four, means that in the Cayley graph, you have to displace by at least 5D plus 4, where D comes from this quasi-isometry. Ah, does this always happen? No. But luckily, the elements in W whose lengths are less than a certain constant, that's just a finite set. And a finite set is not going to bother us, because we're going to have an infinite set at our disposal. We're going to throw out the finitely many bad ones. We will still have infinitely many left. So that will be fine. Um, yeah, so the point is that you can, um, because W is a, is a Coxter group, it has a nice property, which means it's residually finite. That means that whenever an element is non-trivial, there will be a finite index normal subgroup that will not contain it, that will detect it. Or so this intersection of all of these is trivial. So you can look at these. And if you restrict, um, to I prime, so I prime is the set where I have thrown away the bad ones, then in that set, the regularity will be preserved. Okay, so that I have my infinite set, I throw away finitely many, and there it will be preserved. And what is important is that if W is infinite, the indices of these uh, normal subgroups will be unbounded because we have infinitely many of them. And there are only finitely many subgroups of a given finite index, so it must keep going. Okay, what happens with expansion under quasi-isometry? That's rather important. As I said, our strategy is to go from the K, from the polytope to the Cayley graph. We then want to get expansion for the Cayley graphs, but if we then not, not can conclude that we had expansion here, then we're in trouble. So we need to be able to go back. So this proposition allows us to do this. This says that if you have um, two finite connected graphs, Y and Z, and you have this parameter from the beginning, this expanding parameter that had to be at least epsilon, well, this guarantees you that if one of them is at least epsilon, then the other one is at least a minimum of C of epsilon and C prime. And the point is that these constants only depend on the quasi-isometry constants of F. So in itself, for two graphs, this statement, this is not doing much without uh, the fact that this doesn't depend on, the, uh, only depends on this. Because as I said, if you take epsilon small enough for a given graph, it's always true. But it's, it only depends on this. But this is good news, because if this one is at least that, then that one is at least this, and it only depends on this and on the maximum degree, 
This will allow us to transfer our expanding family from the Cayley graph side to the polytope side. Namely, we take two families of graphs of bound at maximum degree. On the one hand, the polytopes, on the other hand, the Cayley graphs. Um, suppose you have a D quasi isometry where D does not depend on M. Remember, I have shown to you before that with this projection, the constants did not depend on the particular normal subgroup that I have taken. So this will be fulfilled for us. This, this uh, constant D is, is not dependent on the family. Well, then, of course, one is a family of expanders if and only if the other is, because we said you are a family if you're at least a certain number independent of the member of your family. But um, the previous result here guarantees that because C and C prime did not depend on the particular member of the family. Okay, so why do we need uh, hyperbolic Coxeter groups? So not all Coxeter groups are, are hyperbolic. Um, well, you want expansion. And so the first thing you could, you could think of, or may, uh, you cannot do it with a finite group W because it will be hard to find infinitely many quotients. So that's bad. Okay, next best thing is maybe um, to look at semi-definite forms. These are things like um, A to tilde or like, um, the next best thing, the semi-definite ones, the problem of these groups is that they are virtually abelian. They look like this tessellation of the plane that I have shown you, which are generated by reflections and then translations. Um, so you might say, oh, what about virtually abelian groups? Um, but they, they are bad for expansion. So basically all the ones that are not hyperbolic, you can cast aside as being unsuitable. So we will need to look at the hyperbolic ones. All right. Um, this is the main theorem that makes the whole strategy work. Um, I will not, and this is very deep results by uh, Ali Reza Salehi Gosefidis is one person in a series of uh, two deep, very deep papers. What we need to remember here is that under certain circumstances, um, if we can embed our group into a general linear group over this um, Z over one over Q zero, then we can get a family of expanders, provided some technical condition is satisfied. So what you need to remember is this is what makes it work on the Cayley graph side. This is why we will get expansion. This condition is guaranteed by a deep theorem by uh, Yves Benoit and Pierre Mellard. Um, and I will now explain why we can get our group in here. So I will try to explain to you why, why we can get the group here. How do we do that? Well. Remember how we set up the Coxter, this bilinear form was minus cosine pi over MST. So you get things like cosine pi over three, cosine pi over four. These are algebraic integers. So they satisfy certain polynomial equations. So that means that you will end up in a number field. I will give an example in a little bit. So you get a, a finite extension of Q. Uh -huh, but that's not good. We don't need to be in Q. We need to be in uh, this Z one over Q zero. So that's not good. Um, we are in this finite extension of Q. Well, this idea um, of why very restriction of scalars is similar to, suppose you have a, a variety over the complex numbers. You can also view this variety over the real numbers just by writing everything as X plus Y, I, and then you get your polynomial equations of your variety. You'll just get twice as many equations uh, over the reals. So the idea of very restriction of scalars is the same. If I have a finite extension of Q, then instead of having um, something over this finite extension, I can write it in a basis over Q and I will get something over Q. So that will bring us, that will bring us into GLN Q. But that's bad. Uh, well, not, not, that's good. It's a good step. We're not there yet. We can get into here. But we need it to be in 1 over Q0. But that's not hard because my groups were finitely generated. So I can look at all of the entries. There's a, like a limited set of matrices. I can look at all the denominators and I can take the least uh, common, multi uh, least lowest common de denominator of the entries. So the least common multiple of the, of the denominators thing. And then I will end up in GLN zero Z over Q zero, one over Q zero. Okay, so that's in these steps. So use very restriction to get into Q and then you just say, well, there's only finitely many entries so I can look at uh, at this denominator, I get in there, and that's what we needed. And then um, this deep result by Salehi Gosofidi gives us the 
gives us the thing. So how do we prove the main results in summary? So the scaling graph pi mw pi ms forms a family of expanders for an appropriate family of m's. You saw them there. I said, run, let it run through this. That's from the, uh, this side. We had our quasi isometries from the scaling graphs to our uh, one skeleton quotiented by these subgroups. And these constants only depended on ws. Then by my transfer result, I had this transfer result that if I said, if one family is an expanding, then the other one is. So that gives me expanding on the skeleton side. Ah, I'm worried about regularity. Well, this I prime ensures that I kick out all the bad ones. So that's fine. My regularity is fine. And this, so this proves the result. I get uh, this regularity and they form an infinite family of expanders. So here's an example. I'll just have a look at the clock. Okay. Um, this is the so-called order 5-4 simplex uh, honeycomb. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the name. These things always have like fancy names. Um, so what is this? Just like we had um, the des desolation of the Euclidean plane by equilateral triangles, uh, what happens is you can look at um, higher dimensional spaces and this one will give a tessellation of hyperbolic force space by compact tiles. So I'll explain now how that works. So this is the one with the Coxter string diagram 3335. So this, this MSTs are uh, when nothing is written is three. So 3335. Um, so let phi be the golden ratio. Why am I starting to talk about the golden ratio? Because uh, pi over five is 36 degrees. So that's strongly related to the golden ratio. So this number field that uh, number fields that I talked about in this particular case, I'm just gonna get Q extended with the golden ratio because these ones are just 60. So it's not gonna do anything. And then this five gives me the golden ratio. You can, so here you can very explicitly write down the matrix for this bilinear form with respect to the canonical basis. And you can do some linear algebra. And you can see that the signature is four, one. So four positive and one negative. That's important because my form needs to be indefinite because as I discussed before, I can't get expansion if my form is definite or semi-definite. So here it's a four, one. Uh, so these are the same as algebraic uh, groups. So yeah, you can look at this bilinear form um, and where the bilinear form is minus one. This is preserved. And both of the sheets are Minkowski models for hyperbolic force space. That's what I told you, you get hyperbolic force space. You can look at the isometry group. I mean, it's a little bit technical, it's not so important. What happens is if you look at the images of these generators inside these groups, they will give you some hyperplanes, just like we had the hyperplanes for the tessellation. And they will gener uh, they generate tessellation of H by compact four simplicious. So, and that's a very beautiful example. You can go online, you can find very nice pictures. There's also pictures of these higher dimensional ones, eight dimensional. I don't know how they do that, but you're supposed to believe it's right. Um, so what is the link of a vertex? So let's have a look. Uh, the vertex here would be these ones. So my set M would be the first one. And then I get this remaining, the 335. This is a, a hexacosichoron. Um, yeah, Francois always insists on these names. I would call it 600 cell. And if you look at the link of an edge again, um, so uh, where, where am I? Here. So this is the link of a vertex is uh, delete this thing. The link of an edge is delete that one. And then you only have these three left, the three last ones. And that gives you a three five. That's an icosahedron. So it's, it's very beautiful. The like regular sorts appear there. Um, yeah, and in this case, you can, I said you needed this very deep theorem by Benoit and de la Harte. Here, it's a little bit easier to, the, to conclude that the conditions of Sal um, Salehi Gosefidi are met. So there's a, there's a result by Borel that will guarantee you this. Um, and so this is a so-called string Dox Coxter diagram, and this gives you 120, 12, 5, 2, and you can see that these numbers are related to the icosahedron, right? Uh, okay. Okay, what about arbitrarily high regularity levels? Because um, Pellet, Chapman, Lineal, they were asking, oh, we can do two, can you do three? And we have now shown that we can do uh, three and uh, four. Can we do anything like arbitrary high? So look at this one. Um, we take this Coxter diagram. 
So 2m minus 1 uh, with here one vertex, and this is our distinguished set m. The one skeleton, um, yeah, the one skeleton of this link is the, is the Johnson graph. So the Johnson graph is a set of m subsets in a set with two m sets. And you can think of this also geometrically. I told you um, we have this process called rectification. If you take a simplex, and now you take, for instance, the midpoints of the edges or the midpoints of the faces, that's, that's equivalent to taking subsets. So you can think of this geometrically as a, a rectification of a, of a simplex. And you can compute these numbers. So since we know it's a Johnson graph, well, there are two M choose M uh, subsets, subsets. And then it starts to break down here. You see, like you take the link of, of the, um, the one that is circled, then the link of that is the one below. And if you now look at the link of that one, it breaks into two pieces, a piece on the left and a piece on the right, which both have m minus one vertices. So this will be a product of two simplices. And this gets you that prism structure that I talk, talked about in the beginning. And I told you <laughs> the prism structure is bad, it's good for regularity, but it's bad because the connectivity will break. So we can do arbitrarily high levels of regularity like this by just making this m bigger. But our problem is that in one step, our link is not connected. So in that sense, we do not answer the questions for all regularity levels. So first we thought we had done it, but then they said, oh, well, it needs to stay connected. But it's quite interesting that uh, the Johnson graph shows up, shows up in so many contexts. So second to last slide, uh, two open problems. Um, so I should define what these sets are. So problem A, I have six uh, sets. So I can look at n. n is my level of regularity. So I talk about a0 up to a minus 1. And hrcn is the set of tuples a0 up to a n minus 1, such that there is a um, highly regular connected graph of that level. hr of n is the same, but you don't insist on connectivity. Then when I put infinity there, it means that there are infinitely many um, examples up to isomorphism. And when I put exp, they form an expanding family. So clearly you get these inclusions, like because it's, it's stronger the more you ask to the left and to the top. So the question is, are any of these inclusions strict for n greater than 1? So we don't know. For n is 1, it's an easy exercise to see what these sets are. Although easy exercise, one of them is Pinsker's result that for k at least 3, there's always a, a family of three regular expanded graphs. But otherwise, it's well known. And a uh, more challenging problem even, I mean, problem B is maybe a little bit silly because we can't even answer problem A. So describe the above six sets as subsets. So I told you like these are these tuples for which you can achieve these regularity levels. Can you actually tell me which, which ones you can realize and which ones you can't? There's some obvious conditions. For instance, um, the first one always needs to be bigger than the one that follows. Uh, if you take K consecutive ones, it needs to be divisible by K factorial. And these you can have in two minutes. And then afterwards, we didn't get any, anything else. So it's kind of difficult to, it seems to get general conditions as to when this can exist or not. There is one ad hoc result that can prove that the 7-4 cannot exist. But it would be interesting to develop some sort of theory that can decide for a large class of tuples whether such families uh, can exist or not. And so I will conclude. Uh, by saying a few words about the work of Fritgut and Illouz. So um, their paper is on the archive and their methods are uh, more combinatorial in nature. So we use a little bit of geometry and number theory. They actually use a very um, nice technique where they define um, new graph products. Yeah, I should have mentioned here for these families, the moment you can prove that such a family is non-empty, it's infinite. Like if such an HR of N is non-empty, it's infinite. And that's because you can do a graph theoretic constructions like Cartesian products. So when you have some sets, you can just make new tuples out of it. That's not difficult. But what Fridgut and Elus did, they define um, a new graph theoretical product, product and then a technique they call symmetrization. And by, by those means, they can, construct, um, they can construct these expanding families uh, even this HRC xn is infinite for all n. So whereas we can um, 
we can do uh, without connectivity, we can do it for all n. But we had that one level where it broke there for the Johnson graph. But with their methods, um, they, they can do it. And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe I'll just keep sharing the online version. So are there any questions from the online community? Can you go ahead like a last slide with the, with the result? Uh, yeah, OK. Okay, it's a question of um, yes. In the second, you see they don't mention expansion of the graphs, but then you show the next one. You say they do show that like they, they do get expanded. Ah, yeah. The question is why my third bullet point, contra well, seemingly contradicts my my yeah, my second one. Um, well, but it's you need to look at the date. So um, so in Fred Good had presented this. At Oberwolfach in April 2019. So we started working on this in April, uh, in March 2020, uh, or no, February 2020. Alex was here just before the COVID. Mm -hmm. And so we worked, and by August or September, we were done. And we were in the belief like, oh, well, they, they can't, they do, don't say anything about expansion. And then we contacted them to say, well, this is what we have achieved. Where are you at? And then they said, well, in the meantime, we, we have proved expansion as well and for all levels. Okay. Yeah. So they're not using super approximation? No, they're not using it. Uh, they're using uh, combinatorial graph theoretic uh, methods, like techniques from hypergraphs and stuff. It's, it's, um, it's quite nice. Their parameters become a lot bigger, but um, it's quite a general method. It's, it's a nice, nice OK, if there are any questions here, I'm happy to read out chat or. Well, if that is not the case, I invite you to unmute yourself and give a clap of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye.